Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Ask a Theologian, the Catholic University of America School of Theology and Religious Studies official podcast. My name is Will Dethridge. I'm a graduate student in historical systematic theology. And joining me here today is Dr. Mark Clark, one of our premier medievalists at this great university. It's wonderful to have you, sir. Thanks, Will. Thanks for asking. It's nice to be here. Yeah, and for those who are unfamiliar with our podcast format, essentially what we do is we pull questions from students and alumni who've commented on social media and have uh, you know, asked us some very insightful uh, questions for their favorite professors. And we've got quite a few good ones today for Dr. Clark. If we could start off, uh, where, where are you right now, uh, Dr. Clark, and what have you been uh, up to this summer? Okay, I'm in Cambridge, England. I just got here. I came over from Oxford. I'm here because, well, um, long story, but research that started five years ago that keeps deepening. <clears throat> it, uh, the, the latest twist, well, there's a number of latest twists. Um, probably the one that would be most interested, interesting to your audience is this. Um, I just finished a book on the middle decades of the 12th century, Peter Lombard's sentences. There's a thing called the biblical gloss. Everybody has long thought Peter Lombard's sentences were kind of a 12th century version of Thomas Aquinas' Summa. Mm. So speculative philosophical theology. Yeah. So a couple of years ago, I discovered earlier versions of the sentences um, that I can prove were that are copies of versions produced by Peter Lombard himself while he was alive. Wow. Um, before now, people have had an edition that it turns out was about 100 years or more later than these ones. So that means we know next to nothing about Peter Lombard. So I took um, early copy, early copies of the biblical gloss that predated his career. And I took a copy that I knew dated to the 1160s right after his career. And I compared them. And I wrote this book. And what it shows is that those who made Peter Lombard in the image and likeness of Thomas Aquinas were mistaken. Mm -hmm. that it was Bible in, Bible out, Bible all the way. Um, it wasn't written at the end of his life at one time as a speculative masterwork as everybody thought it was. <clears throat> Instead, it was written as a doctrinal primer for theologians to do the main work of any theologian, which is uh, work on the Bible. Mm -hmm. So um, people over here are incredibly excited about that book. They're even more excited about one right behind it because I guess the second big reveal for this trip is that we, I and a few others have discovered that, well, put it this way, there's a famous book written 50 or 40 years ago. <clears throat> I think it was published in 1984. It was a dissertation of a few years before that by a very a preeminent English scholar named Christopher de Ham. And he thought, he, he made the thesis that those who published Peter Lombard published the biblical gloss, <clears throat> right? Mm -hmm. That in other words, there was a book trade, that there were publishers in Paris that early. Um, famous scholars, two famous American scholars, Richard and Mary Rouse, didn't find evidence to support that. They thought that whole thing arose around 1200. Well, it turns out to Hamill was right. And I've got the evidence. <clears throat> so really they had a system. Um, the, the analogy that we would understand would be Microsoft 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. So I've found Microsoft 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0 for Peter Lombard sentences. The edition we had was probably Microsoft 565.0. It's wow. 110 years too late. 
Um, now, what difference does this make, Will? Well, um, it means that the Second Vatican Council and the Catholic Church, not the Holy Spirit, mind you, Dei, Dei Verbum describes medieval theology perfectly. But you'll notice that the schoolmen are not mentioned in Dei Verbum. That's because everybody thought that the schoolmen um, did philosophical theology, right? They commented mm -hmm. on philosophy, Aristotle, whereas the fathers commented on scripture. Right. The reason, the reason they thought that is because, well, the, the, a lot of the parity for the council were medievalists. They were looking for the antecedents of Thomas Aquinas. Yeah. And there was one kind of book that they didn't open. And that would be lectures in the Bible. Now, it just so happens that lectures on the Bible make up 90 to 95 percent of all of the extant evidence from the Middle Ages. So it's fair to say that those scholars, and hence the fathers of the Second Vatican Council, just got medieval theology completely wrong. Wow. How's that? Yeah. How's that, for a, how's that for a tidbit? It means that there is no discontinuity whatsoever between patristic and medieval theology. It means the Bible was foundation and apex. Now, there's a fork in the road when you get to St. Thomas, when he tries to base scientific theology on Aristotle's metaphysics. But this other tradition still continues through Bonaventure and the Franciscans. And even Thomas Quinn himself probably wouldn't disagree with anything I'm saying here. Right. It's just that we, we had it wrong. <clears throat> we had it dead wrong. And so wow. the peop people over here to say that they're excited is an understatement. And so I got, I'm going to publish. In fact, I just got the proofs today for one book, a 600 page book with the British Academy. But then this other book that I've just finished, I'm going to publish that very quickly. And then this other volume behind it. And here's the last reveal. Will. I know you asked a simple question I'm giving you. But you asked, you asked what That's I was exciting doing. That's exciting stuff. So, <clears throat> it turns out that there was something in the 12th century that nobody's ever known about. Um, I've seen evidence for it for 25 years. And it's related to this public publications system in Paris before 1160. But it was, you see evidence for it in every cathedral library, every monastic library. In other words, all Microsoft 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, they spread throughout Europe like wildfire because there was an evangelical movement, an evangelical intellectual movement centered in the cathedral schools, but spilling over into the monasteries that nobody knows about. Wow. Yeah, so it means that essentially the church, everybody misunderstood scholasticism. Now that that's remarkable. That's some fantastic work. And, you know, we'd be, I mean, obviously the department's going to be <clears throat> eager to feature all your incredible work. So uh, we students will be eagerly awaiting its publication like that, because that certainly turns a lot of... Uh, preconceived notions about medieval theology on their head like that. Um, and yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think if you take a classic like Congar's History of Theology, mm. right, where he says what everybody believes, that the fathers did biblical commentary and the schoolmen uh, commented on, uh, you know, speculative philosophical works. Yeah. He was just wrong. Mm. Now, the reason he was wrong, it's not Clark versus Congar. It's not a matter of interpretation. What it's actually like, Will, is dinosaur bones. Mm, yeah. I found all the dinosaur bones. Wow. That's it. It's real simple. Yeah. So I'm guessing that's what you've been doing, is spending so much time over there in Cambridge you, where they have access to that. Yeah, kind of yeah. Right? Talking, about, talking about the various publishing projects and looking at manuscripts and writing and editing furiously. Pretty much what I do all the time when I'm not teaching. Wow. Well, that's fantastic. And we're really excited to see where this project goes. And, you know, on that note, you, you've already mentioned, uh, you know, the, uh, I, I suppose, mythos or um, generalization of... Oh, it's a myth. It's a myth. 
Yeah, the uh, myth of uh, medieval theology being completely <laughs> speculative, centered, a bit logical removed. as opposed to biblical, right? Right. Um, and Ariel Hobbs, you know, one of our students, uh, I'm sure you uh, may I recall her. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, she, uh, she, one of her questions was specifically about some of the biggest uh, medieval myths or myths about sure. medieval theology. I'm guessing that this would probably rank high on one of them. Uh, so forgive us if you've uh, already answered that question, but are there any other ones that come to mind like well, that? Well, no, the main, the main, the, 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 this one is, is the big one, right? That, yeah. that the notion that it was discontinuous with patristic theology, that the Bible was not central to it. Um, yeah, it's connected to, well, let's talk about logic. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that the schoolmen used logic and the fathers did not. Well, that's just false. All you have to right. do is read, read Augustine. Yeah. Read, read De Doctrina Christiana, right? Yeah. Um, the Greek fathers, they were trained in Greek philosophy. Of course, yes. they, used they, they knew Aristotle, they knew Plato, they knew the Neoplatonic tra traditions, they knew the Stoic traditions, they knew Stoic logic, they knew Aristotelian formal logic. So, you know, these are, these are more prejudices than, than knowledge. Mm. And, um, yeah. So I suppose for Ariel, though, I would tell her one other great myth is this, that Thomas Aquinas had all the answers. Ah, um, I love that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. probably the, the, the one that most people think. They think that <clears throat> Thomas Aquinas, the, the, the holy saint, the genius who died in 1274, I think, had all the answers. Well, actually, you know, he didn't. Um, what he did, he, what, you know, Thomas was more like Plato. Um, he, he, he reordered everything. Right. And after Thomas, everybody had to deal with the questions he asked mm. and the frameworks he put in place, but he didn't have all the answers. A lot of, a lot of what he, what he tried to do had to be fixed, mm. um, because of logical and other mistakes. Could so, you mention a couple examples there just because, uh, yeah, like if oh yeah, perfect example. His well, his 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 treatment of individuality by matter is problematic to say the least. There's also the uh, the well known example of the Immaculate Conception, right? Which is a very good example because the logic needed to give a rational account, right? Um, the modal logic system. Um, needed to give that account wasn't yet in place. So, right. yeah. And so really, I mean, the, the best way to get to know anybody is to read their critics, mm. right? And so if you really want to know Thomas Aquinas well, read Henry of Ghent and Godfrey of Fontaine, mm. right? And, uh, right, and those guys, and, um, and of course, Dune Scotus. Well, yeah, I think that leads segues into a uh, you know really good question asked by one of our alumni, um, Liam O'Toole. Uh, could you describe some of the major differences between Duns Scotus and Thomas Aquinas, and how those conflicts or splits between them have led to different branches of theological development over the years? Okay, well, I'm probably going to give you a different answer than the one you asked because. They're more alike than not alike, and here's why. Okay. If you think about the realist tradition, okay, realist epistemology, <laughs> based on the categories of Aristotle, and realist metaphysics, Scotus is actually the guy that's the top of the realist tradition. Mm. Okay, he is, he's the one who fixed Thomas's mistakes. Ah, interesting. Right? That's, what, that's what really happened. And so that's why Scotus, well, I mean, let's just talk, okay. Yeah. Let's talk about proofs for God's existence. Let's just take a simple example, right? Because sure. everybody's heard about the five ways, right? Yeah. 
<clears throat> so if you ask me, do the five ways work? I would say yes and no. Sure, they prove a first mover or whatever, right? But the problem is they beg the one question they're intended to prove. They assume what they're trying to prove, right? Because they're trying to get to prove a Christ, the existence of a Christian God, a personal God. Right. Well, there's nothing in the proofs that make that jump. Mm, right? Yep. It's fudged. Mm. Right? SCOTUS yep. doesn't fudge it. Mm. SCOTUS, that's why SCOTUS's proof for existence of God is so long, so logically detailed, right? So <clears throat> in a sense, that's a microcosm. SCOTUS and Thomas are on the same track, right? And so SCOTUS is really just someone who is an infinitely better logician. And he has read the crit critics, the critiques of, of Thomas and Bonaventure. And, and he has pulled all this together in a <clears throat> sort of the high point of the realist tradition. Gotcha. Right, right before Occam. So um, that's why in the 16th, the Thomistic tradition after Scotus, has has to absorb the scotistic vocabulary and the scotistic fixes because mm. if they don't they just look dumb anybody who takes the position that thomas aquinas the guy that died in 1274 was the high point of the church tradition is just dumb they're just mm. well they're probably just ignorant right um, yeah right they they just don't know any better and um but it would be like claiming that newton is the high point of physics yeah, yeah. No, right. I think that's an excellent way of putting it because that's certainly a huge issue <laughs> in many Catholic circles. And you know, as a young uh, you know theologian myself, I often encounter that with uh, a lot of other, you know the, with the rise of neo Thomistic uh, theology and uh, traditions like that. There, uh, I've encountered far too many people who say uh, philosophy ended with. Aquinas and I just think no, yeah that's... no it, it, you know Augustine at the uh, end of the first book of his 12 books on Genesis according to the letter he's got a famous quote um, quoted all the time throughout the Middle Ages including by Thomas Aquinas himself <laughs> and the quote goes something like this I'll paraphrase it. it says he's talking about the Bible he said if we know something from science and science proves something to be true that contradicts how we're interpreting the Bible. We have to change our interpretation of the Bible because there's only yeah. one truth. Yep. And if we don't, we make the church look stupid. Mm -hmm. So people who deny that the logical problems created by a number of Thomas's positions, they just make the church look stupid. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And 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 it's. Uh, and ironically, they, they do Thomas himself a disservice. I mean, Thomas was a great oh, genius. Yeah. He's a great genius, right? And, um, you know, everybody after Thomas Aquinas took Thomas Aquinas as a starting point, right? Mm -hmm. Shows you how influential he was. Yes. But none of them, not even the Dominicans, took him as given all the right answers. So, right. It's, it's twisting the tradition. It's, yeah. uh, and you know, it's, it's a sign that it's a sign of what I, I tend to think we're in an intellectual dark age, not just mm -hmm. in the church, but within the church too. Yeah. yeah. Well, we appreciate your insight and hopefully our viewers and listeners will as well. So we can avoid falling into those traps like that. Cause it's, uh, yeah, I, th I think it's just part of human nature to kind of cling on to or attach yourself to one specific person. Yeah, or... yeah you want certitude for whatever. Yep. But I mean, it's pretty simple, right? All you have, I look, Will, here's the simplest way for me to put it. Mm -hmm. When I was your age, how old are you? I'd say I'm 23. Okay, when I was your age, I was a convinced Thomas. Mm. Nice. And what, <laughs> happened? what happened? Well, I read. Yep. I read yeah. and I read and I read. Yeah. Right. And now I'm actually more impressed with Thomas than I was then. Mm. I also sort of know how things developed. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think that, you know, 
Thomas Aquinas himself, uh, you know, and, and I tell this to people I come across who uh, are, are purists with him. I, I say he wouldn't have appreciated the way that he's put up on this pedestal right. and treated right. like that. He, so he was too, he was too interested in the truth. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, backtracking a little bit to one of the, uh, you know, aspects of research that you've uh, focused on, uh, there's actually a student from Yale who's been following the podcast, uh, Mark Florig, who wants to know a little bit more about that evangelical awakening of the 12th okay, century, sure. Sure. specifically if it can be compared to the more modern awakenings of uh, Catholicism or Protestantism that occurred, especially in uh, the American context. Um, sure. Yeah. yeah sure. Well, about the American awakenings, I don't probably know very much. Um, I know a bit about the Oxford movement, but uh, gotcha. But I know that the one that occurred in the 12th century and before was remarkable. Mm. Uh, for its for it, the spread, it was ubiquitous. Um, it was centered on the Bible, mm. um, and it. It's hard to compare anything else to it because it led to such a flood of saints. It led to the universities, <laughs> right, mm. <clears throat> which were emphatically in this tradition. I mean, the, the motto of the University of Paris, Sapientia Christiana, refers to the whole notion of this Christian wisdom tradition founded on the Bible. Everyone I read about, all these guys, they sound like the saints and doctors and fathers of the ancient church. They, they want to reform the episcopacy. <clears throat> They're against ambitious, rich bishops. Mm. They want virtuous bishops, right? They, they want, they, they're filled, absolutely filled with, with uh, the zeal of the gospel, to spread mm. the gospel, to live the gospel. So when you see people like Francis and Dominic show up in the early 13th century, right, founding the Franciscans and the Dominicans, this is no surprise. I mean, this right. is a this is a tsunami, mm. a tsunami evangelical uh, movement. So, and I guess, I guess I would say, you know, we could use another one. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think that leads perfectly well. Mark asked a follow-up question about medieval piety itself or, you know, just uh, the way that people around this time uh, treated their faith or, you know, treated just modeled their everyday behavior after the faith. Are, are there any specific examples that come to mind as far as behaviors we can emulate? of, uh, you know, popular medieval figures of the time, or even just standard practices in their daily life that you think uh, would help us to be better Catholics and, you know. Um, well, yeah, I mean, all you have to do is read. You, you could read almost anybody. <laughs> you could read almost any of the greats. Um, St. Bernard, right, um, his, his works on conversion are astonishing. Um, and of course, you know, look at, well, all you have to do is look at the monastic revivals. Look at how right. many monasteries were found. I mean, uh, you know, it was <laughs> hundreds and hundreds, right, of religious, maybe thousands even of religious foundations sweeping over Europe. Um, but what I, I tend to think of as really interesting, two things. The Holy Spirit met the needs of the time. So cities were growing and expanding. There was trade <clears throat> all throughout Europe. There was security. The, the extension of the king's power in France led to the kind of security, let the economy grow. And so you had the cathedrals became centers of spirituality, right? At St. Victor in Paris <laughs> and in other places. And again, the glossed Bible. Everybody right. wanted to have the Bible to really know the tradition. 
yeah. so they put together this gloss Bible with with the key sayings of the fathers so that everybody could have it at their fingertips. And preaching was was incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. And then because the population grew and expanded, you had Dominic and Francis going on the road. They would just go on the road and talk to people, right? Mm. And they were poor, right? And so they took the evangelical councils really serious mm. in a way that, you know, <clears throat> again, I do have a draft of a book on called entitled Christianity and Capitalism. Ah, interesting. Yeah, I think it'll be interesting. I'll make lots of, I'll probably be attacked by people on the left and the right. Mm. But essentially the thesis would be something like this. Mm. As you know, so many people try to politicize Christianity and attach yep. it to this economic system or that economic system. Yep. But I think the, the guys in the Middle Ages knew because they knew their Augustine well. And they knew that as, as Augustine said, if you think about the map I always talked about in class, yeah, yes. we're infinitely different, distant from God. And so nothing, it's the pearl of great price, right? There's nothing here worth anything compared to that. Yeah. <clears throat> right? And so, so they, they, they knew, people like Peter John O'Levy knew that Christianity is going to be incoherent with any economic system. Right. Because you can't, there's no, there's no, how can you, how are you going to be able to assign values? Yeah. And, and so they, to a remarkable degree, practiced um, the virtue of poverty and perhaps one might also say humility, huh? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, they practiced all kinds of virtues and the list of saints is long, long indeed. Um, but uh, certainly we, it would be, put what I would say, Will, would be, may God um, bring about another, um, uh, effort, you know, flowering of sanctity and saints in our own yep. age. We certainly yeah. need. How's that? Yeah, that's wonderful. And, you know, it, it's something, you know, in the podcast that I've talked to a lot of professors about is it seems like the best theologians um, who ever lived, you know, all the, the greats, matched their intellectual side with living out the faith. And I, I think that's something that's increasingly difficult in a secular academic age. And, um, you know, Catholic you, thank God, really encourages us to mesh those together, yeah. the intellectual <laughs> and faithful aspects. But it's tough sure. because the broader discipline of theology in many senses uh, has been uh, secularized uh, in, in a lot of universities. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's, no, it's true. And well, you know the 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 uh, the famous medieval motto "docere verbo et exemplo," right? To teach by word and example. Yeah. And Saint Francis's famous line to his followers: "Go preach, right? And if you have to say something, do that too." Yes. Yes. Well, you know, if we could just conclude the podcast with one more question, because sure. you know you've done some really remarkable work, uh, and it's taken you. Uh, all sorts of fascinating places like Cambridge over there. Um, and, you know, many uh, people in my position, uh, you know, being aspiring uh, young theologians or people who are interested in the field of theology, you know, we, we like to know exactly how you guys got to where you are today. So if you could just give us a brief background of how you got into becoming a theologian and oh. just... <laughs> sure. Well, in my case, in my case, it was just providence, really, because mm. um, I, uh, when I was at law school at Duke, the law school encouraged us to take classes in the art school. And a friend of mine, um, the godfather was Jacques Maritain, whom you've probably heard of. Wow. And, you know, talked me into taking a class to read all of Maritain's books. And I did with Ed Mahoney, later Father Ed Mahoney. And uh, so I started reading Bonaventure and Aquinas and Scotus way back then. 
And Ed, <clears throat> Ed, after the class, he said, "Look, you know, you're you're pretty interested in this. You're you you have some some potential here." He goes, "How's your Latin?" So I said, "Well, I had a year of Latin using Wheelock in college. I made straight A's and learned nothing." And uh, and I go, "So how do I learn Latin?" He said, "Well, Erasmus says his dictum is the best thing to follow. Learn the main rules and then read a lot, which is what I did." Hmm. So I would say. God was there all along, helping me at every turn, far more than I deserved. But um, you can't you can't work on the Middle Ages. You can't do any real work on the Middle Ages unless you're Latin, unless you can read Latin more or less the way you can read English, mm. and also unless you know how to work with manuscripts. Because right. This is a good thing to close with, because the reason, well, I'm not over here, you know, I've been over here five, five years now. <clears throat> um, British Academy had me over five years. They keep having me over. Why? Well, um, because I can read the manuscripts. But, Will, I just go into the libraries, mm -hmm. and I open them up, and I start reading. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing to it. Yeah. Any, anybody could do it. And... As I said before, 90% of them haven't been read. <laughs> so wow. unlike, the under, unlike the age of the fathers, when, let's take Ambrose, for example. We have good editions of Ambrose, right? They're good. They're not great. They were made by the Austrian Academy in the 1880s and 90s, the Corpus Scriptorum, Ecclesiasticorum, Latinorum, those series. They need to be redone. But at least we have somewhat critical editions. Yeah. We have no critical editions for Bonaventure. <clears throat> wow. Most of the most of the works, including the Summa, Thomas Aquinas, there's no critical edition, not even close. Mm. So yeah. <clears throat> the workers are the workers are needed in the field if you're interested in that sort of thing. But I would say, um, you know, for me it was a passion. And unbeknownst to me, God was behind the door. Hmm. You know, you already know that. And so follow the Lord where he's leading you. And um, I would say really pursue whatever really interests you. Um, and do it, do, it, uh, do it well and deeply and learn whatever skills you need to have. Not everybody is going to be interested in hanging out in dusty libraries right um, right um, but um, the church the church needs um, needs young theologians who want to be saints yeah no oh, that's wonderful well thank you so much dr clark for all your wisdom and insight there um, I, have, you know. I don't know how much wisdom i have or insight <laughs> i think what i have is a bunch of curmudgeonly uh, curmudgeonly opinions however um, the evidence to back them up is, uh, is will will be in print very very soon. So I'm Great. all on the way. All right, Lord. thank you, thank you for having me. Thanks for your time, um, and God bless you and yours. Yeah, thank you very much, sir. And you know, to those listening, be sure to check us out on YouTube and Spotify. And you know, if you have any theologians uh, at Catholic U that you'd like us to interview next or some questions you have for them, feel free to comment below. Thank you all very much. Have a great day. God bless you.